The kind of repentance that Christ offers is complete and total. And if you have had an abortion and you've repented, not only are you truly forgiven, but also your life then can become a testimony to life. The woman, note this, the woman that founded the pro-life movement was herself someone who had an abortion. And she founded the pro-life movement. The pro-life movement is a woman's movement. Feminists talking about abortion talk about speaking for women. They don't speak for all women. Most women, most people in the pro-life movement are women. So all you feminists claiming to speak for women who are pro-abortion, saying that you're talking on behalf of women, stop lying. So ladies and gentlemen, all right. as I am sure you have heard on the news, the Supreme Court of the United States has sent back the issue of Roe v. Wade to the individual states of America. Now, this is a wonderful, magnificent decision, a step forward in terms of civilization, that the brutality and violence of abortion has received a smack to the face. And democracy has been strengthened in the United States. That those government representatives elected by their electorates have the right, if they are elected to do so, to restrict the barbaric and savage act of child murder in the United States. However, we want to recognize that this is from beginning to end a Christian victory. Christians are the ones that have been at the forefront of the battle against child murder in the Western world that has resulted in 9.5 million deaths of human beings unborn in their mother's wombs in the UK alone. That's more than died in any Nazi death camp and it is only dwarfed by the horrors of the communist gulag. The death centers of the liberal progressives that hack and snip little children to pieces in their mother's wombs can now be stopped in states in the USA. Those centers that pour the equivalent of acid or explode human life in vacuums can now be stopped because governments in the states can do so. But what can we learn as Christians from the victory of the pro-life movement? It teaches us as Christians, it teaches us that, talking about pro-life, it's talking about what does it teach us, ladies and gentlemen? It teaches us the importance, I will take questions in a moment, I'll take questions in a moment. It teaches us the importance as Christians of seizing control of the commanding heights of society. I'll need water, bro. What are those commanding heights? Government, the judiciary, religious institutions, arts and culture, economic institutions. All of these systems shepherd our lives and form our understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Because we had a president in America willing to put Christians who are pro-life in the Supreme Court, we have managed to strike at the heart of Roe v. Wade and a genocide 
and a holocaust against the unborn. It shows that if Christians become political, and if Christians in politics work with Christians in the judiciary, and work with Christians in economic systems, and legal systems, and cultural forums, that we can build a mass movement that shepherds society away from injustice, away from sin, and towards virtue and righteousness. These lessons that we've seen the fruits of in the decision about Roe v. Wade, we can apply also to other issues of Christian concern. Other issues like the transgender movement, other issues like the definition of marriage, other issues like the persecution of our brothers and sisters. These are the kinds of lessons that we can learn from the pro-life movement. How do you stand up to injustice culturally, politically, economically, socially, in the legal system, and so on. But make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, what you are about to see in America is the hypocrisy of progressives. Note their violence against churches now. Note their violence against Christian pregnancy council centers in the USA. These same virtue signaling hypocrites who lecture us about tolerance, who lecture us about diversity, who lecture us about inclusion and equality, will this very Sunday be interrupting the Catholic Mass. This very week will firebomb Christian charities because these progressives are hypocrites. Christians, do not be afraid of the militancy of the left. Stand up to defend your churches. Stand up to defend our pregnancy centers and our charities. Stand up to defend our belief system and our community. There is nothing in the Christian faith that teaches us to be doormats and to be bullied by progressive militants. So, ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions before I move on? Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, last chance, any questions on the topic? Okay, I'm going to move on. Ladies and gentlemen, the fight against abortion is as old as time. The church from its earliest days has always opposed abortion. The Catechism of the Church says this, and I invite you to move a bit closer. Come in, come in. Don't be shy. No one around you's got COVID. You're not gonna die. And I'm sure everyone had a bath this morning. So come in a bit so that people can walk past you at the back. I'm gonna speak a little calmer. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states this, since the first century, the church has affirmed the moral evil of every procured abortion. This teaching has not changed and remains unchangeable. Direct abortion, that is to say abortion 
willed either as an end or a means is gravely contrary to moral law. Christians from earliest times sharply distinguished themselves from the pagans around them because the pagans around them, as they do today, were pro-abortion and Christians were against abortion. The Romans and the Greeks in antiquity would take newborn children and leave them on the pavement to die from exposure. Infanticide was a common practice in antiquity and the Christians would go and collect these children from the curb and take them into Christian homes and would then take care of groups of children in the very first orphanages of history. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, orphanages were a contribution of the Christian church. And they did this because they followed the teachings of the New Covenant found in the New Testament that recognises that life begins in the womb. Because Elizabeth, when she heard Mary's voice, said, why is it that the mother of my Lord should visit me? Which means that Jesus was the Lord of Elizabeth from conception, not from birth. The Didache, the first document ever written after the New Testament, and the letters of Barnabas, an early Christian manuscript, condemn both the practices of abortion as well as did regional councils of the early church. Now, it's clear that we know more about embryology today than the early Christians did in their day. But it is also clear that the church had an unmistaken pro-life position from its very birth and has done since then to the day. The early Greeks believed that the soul was given at a point after conception. But we Christians never believed that this justified abortion. The fifth century church father, Saint Augustine, writing in the 5th century, who knew about the philosophy of the Greeks and their idea of ensoulment, rejected the idea of abortion. He rejected it and believed it was committing homicide. He added that God has the power to make all human deficiencies or lack of development in the resurrection complete. So we cannot assume that the earliest aborted children will be excluded from eternal life in God. The 13th century church father, Thomas Aquinas, made extensive use of Aristotle's thought, including the theory of the rational soul but he also rejected abortion as gravely wrong at every stage, observing that it is a sin against nature. Christians, we cannot compromise on the issue of being pro-life. This is a red line issue for the church. We cannot surrender an inch to the child murderers and their apologists who support the genocide of unborn children in abortion clinics. We must fight them politically. 
We must fight them socially. We must fight them culturally. We must fight them economically. We must lay down our lives, if necessary, to defend the unborn against a genocidal society that is polluted by a progressive political thought that contradicts philosophy, contradicts science, contradicts moral law, contradicts the Bible, and sacrifices children for the ego of women who don't want to take responsibility for their sexual acts and for men who don't want to take responsibility for their sexual acts. Any questions? Go on. baby's healthy, she wants to have the child, and she has the choice of her own life and the life of her child. In case she were to become pregnant, she would die, and, or her child would live. What does the church say about the choice of who should live? Should the mother forsake her child, or should she be selfless and say, no, let my child live and let me die? What, what would you say about that? So we must do in that kind of situation all that we can do to save both lives. However, there are examples and circumstances where that is impossible. And there is a principle within the church called double jeopardy, which is that if a pregnancy, or rather, let me put it another way, if there is a, co a medical condition requiring the removal of the womb, but that action will also result in the death of the embryo because the end goal is not abortion but to deal with another life-threatening condition you can carry out the operation to save the woman's life even if it results in the death of a child so there is an exception because but yes but let's be clear no let's be clear the point of such an operation is never to carry out an abortion Exactly. So I'm saying, if the intent of the action is to treat another condition, i.e. you're not trying to commit an abortion. JC, there's no need to move the camera. So, One second, sir. Sir, sir, one second. Sir, one second. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Sir, one second. Sir, one second, sir. Sir, listen. I'm going to see if there are any other questions. If there are no other, right? Say again, sorry. What I'm saying is that there is absolutely no justification for an abortion in any circumstances at all, whatever. So it doesn't matter how many conditions and qualifications you introduce to the argument, there is no justification for murdering children in their wombs. What we should do is invest in the technologies and develop the treatments that would allow the saving of both the mother and the child. And ladies and gentlemen, I have hope because we are very close to creating artificial wombs. We've already raised a lamb in an artificial womb. It grew in a womb, not in a lamb. So when we come across circumstances where we are forced to choose, let me finish, let me finish, and then let me see if someone else wants to ask a question. If we are facing a situation where we can save both the mother and the child through the use of technology, of course we should use it and develop it. Any other questions? Right, do you want to come back with a question? Okay. Any other questions? No, go on. Do you distinguish between surgical abortion and pharmaceutical abortion? Okay. So the question is, 
Is there a distinguishment between surgical abortion and pharmaceutical abortion? And the answer is there is no difference. If you take a pill that kills your child, it is same as going to an abortion clinic and allowing a surgeon to blow your child up in a vacuum or chop them up with scissors inside the womb and then pull them out with pliers. Let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen. The act of abortion is an act of violence from start to beginning. But I want to be clear. In the pro-life debate, there's always one issue that never gets talked about, which is why are we not holding the men responsible for the life that they create? Why is all the responsibility falling on the woman to make the decision, to make the choice about whether she wants to bring the child? Men should be held accountable for every life they create and should be held responsible for the supporting of that life even if they are not in a relationship with the woman. Any other questions? Go on, madam. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, politically you've all been duped. You've been lied to by the culture because they've invented a word called the fetus and they've used that word to mask the fact that what we're talking about is a human life in its earliest stage. The argument goes something like this. A fetus is just a clump of cells. It's not alive. What a rubbish statement. An amoeba is a single cell. It's still alive. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are just a clump of cells still, even now. Any other questions? What's my profession? So, the question is, what is my profession? My profession, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm a part-time evangelist. So the lady is pointing to the fact that this is not a medical opinion, that it's not a doctor saying this to you. But all I am doing, ladies and gentlemen, is repeating the opinions of countless Christian doctors who argue avidly for life and argue avidly that the fetus is alive because it is alive. No one can give any evidence that the fetus is not alive without coming up with a definition of life that doesn't stand up to scrutiny and self-contradiction. Her first, then you. Okay, so the lady has studied at school and believes that the definition she has been taught by a culture that is pro-abortion is correct. Madam, the educational system has lied to you. There are countless doctors and biologists who are Christians who would argue avidly that the fetus is alive. You've been lied to by your textbooks. So, if a couple were to make love and the man was ejecting sperm, there's no life created, he's still wasting life in sex, isn't he? <laughs> Think about that for a second before you answer. Sperm is alive and kicking, yeah? So, if a man was to eject, and no baby was full, hasn't he also taken away something that God passed a sacred life? So, ladies and gentlemen, the argument is, how can you hold this position when through the act of ejaculation, millions, tens of millions of sperm cells die? 
and he's quite right. Sperm cells are living things and they do die, which proves, ladies and gentlemen, by that very argument that a fetus is alive. But we Christians have no concept of sacred sperm. We don't say that the life of sperm is sacred life. We say that human life is sacred. And human life is decided by what is genetically human. Sperm cells are not genetically human and so they don't fall under the category of sacred life. Any other questions? Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, go on, man. Sorry? Yeah. Forgiveness. Yeah. That, do you agree? So, ladies and gentlemen, the question is what should a lady do if she has had an abortion? I would encourage you, if you have had an abortion, to seek counselling for any guilt that you might feel and to recognise that in Jesus Christ, every truly repentant sinner receives forgiveness and that forgiveness is complete and total and absolute. The sins that society led you into are not the sins that have to define your life. By your repentance you cannot only receive forgiveness for your own sin but by your repentance you may be able to give a testimony to God's forgiveness in how he forgave you. Let's just let the ambulance through. Okay. So, the kind of repentance that Christ offers is complete and total. And if you have had an abortion and you've repented, not only are you truly forgiven, but also your life then can become a testimony to life. The woman, note this, the woman that founded the pro-life movement was herself someone who had an abortion. And she founded the pro-life movement. The pro-life movement is a woman's movement. Feminists talking about abortion talk about speaking for women. They don't speak for all women. Most women, most people in the pro-life movement are women. So all you feminists claiming to speak for women who are pro-abortion, saying that you're talking on behalf of women, stop lying. You're not speaking on behalf of women. You're just speaking on the behalf of women that say what you say. And there are countless millions of women that disagree with you, that believe abortion is murder, and they're right to do so. Any other questions? No, I didn't say that. What did you say? I said it is life, yeah. but it's not sacred life. Okay, if that's the case then, in the book of Genesis, when I think the son of one of the forefathers, he lost a son. And the son who took over, the son who took over his brother's position, deliberately spilt what, you know, he never ejaculated. As a result, he displeased God yes, by doing so. That's correct. So you're saying one moment, it, it, it's not life, so it's not displeasing, but God is specifically saying in the book of Genesis, it's displeasing to him. So why would something that is not of any worth be displeasing to him? Right, so let me ask, let me answer that. It's a very well-crafted question. Well, it it's a very intelligent question. But the, but the answer is a simple one. 
the, the, the reason why the act is, is condemned is because it is self-gratuitous and it's self-pleasing and it is something that contravenes natural law in, let me finish in terms of what ejaculation is about about is supposed to be about ejaculation the act of orgasm is about the creation of life yes. so then if you act in such a way as to ejaculate in a way that's not about creating life you're going against natural law so wait one second so something can be a sin something can be a sin but a different category of sin an ejaculation that's not about creating life is still a sin but it's not the same sin as killing life let someone else let me check if someone else wants to ask a question any other questions ladies and gentlemen yes 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 the, 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 the pill that stops life being created is a sin, but it isn't the same sin as abortion. There you go. Any other questions on the topic? Okay. Any, any other questions? Last chance. Exactly. Just ladies and gentlemen, see, think about the misleading language that our cultural acolytes talk about abortion in. They talk about the fetus as if it's not alive or if it's not human. They talk about the idea of potential life as if it's not already alive or human. The language that we use to talk about abortion is deceptive and misleading and it is misleading for ideological reasons they are dishonest any other questions on the topic of abortion going once question i'm all right yeah good Shall we? You had a question, did you not? Okay, ask a question, then let the lady ask a question. Go on. Okay. Uh, do you know, when, when do you think human life starts? Okay, so the question is, ladies and gentlemen, as a Christian, when do I believe human life starts? The answer is, at the point of conception. Wait, let the lady ask a question. Come back to you. No, I'm going to come back. I'll come back to you. Go on. One question, one answer. Done. Do you believe in democracy? Sorry? Do you believe in democracy? I'm really sorry. I didn't catch the question. Do I believe in what? Depo? Or democracy? Okay. So the question is, ladies and gentlemen, do I believe in democracy? Yes. And those states in the United States that have outlawed abortion have done it democratically and legally. And democracy has been strengthened, has been strengthened by the court's decision to send Roe v. Wade back to the states. Why? Because the law, Roe v. Wade, prevented the states in the US who electedly wanted to prohibit abortion from doing so, thus denying the democratic right of the majority of people in those states. Let me go back to him, then to him, then to you. Okay. You said that earlier that life doesn't exist apart from conception. That's when life begins. Yes. Why in the Bible does it say that? that uh, Jesus' descendants were in the loins, not, not in the conception, in the loins yes. of Abraham. Yes. So if that's the case... So the question is, the Bible talks about the descendants of Abraham being in the loins of Abraham. So surely this implies that life is before conception. What the Bible is talking about here is an obvious fact that you are the descendant of your father and your father's father and your father's 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 father and so on and for, so forth 
and also of your mother as well. That is what the Bible is talking about in that position. Do you have another question, madam? Do you have another question? Great question. So the question, ladies and gentlemen, is only 30% of Americans are against abortion. Do you remember during the Brexit debate when they, all the census reports told you that most people were in favour of Remain? And then what happened? We had Brexit. Do you remember during the election campaign between Clinton and Trump that all the census reports said that Clinton was going to stomp it 60-40 in favour of Clinton and then Trump won. Do not believe the census that says that written by progressives, asked to progressives, by progressives, that confirms a progressive viewpoint. The fact of the matter is in 13 states of the United States, that's nearly 50% of the American population, they elected pro-life Republican candidates to the Senate. The only census that matters in a democracy is the one that happens in the ballot box. Go on, sir. Do you think you're in any position to have to comment on, on, a, on a woman's right for choice? So the question is, ladies and gentlemen, as a man, what right do I have to make commentary on a, a woman's fertilization practices and her reproductive choices? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a slave owner or a slave trader. But do you think that I have the right to condemn slavery? Of course I do. Men are 50% of every reproductive act that ever occurs. Of course men have the right to comment on this debate. But I wonder if those same progressive women who were saying, my body, my choice, would agree with this logic, my money, my choice. If you believe that no man has the right to choose whether you have a child, then you have no right to demand that a man pays for the child that you choose to have. Ooh. Furthermore, why is it those same women who say men don't have the right to comment on female reproduction were happy to accept male judges legalizing and upholding the practice of abortion. In other words, it's not about male-female commentary on reproduction. This is simply a hypocritical rhetoric trying to exclude the rightful choice denied to fathers to protect the life of their children. Any other questions on the topic of abortion? Could I just say this? I just want to thank my mother for not aborting me and her five granddaughters thank her for not aborting me as well because I would not be here. I'm here, five granddaughters are here. Thank you, Mum, for not killing us. Thanks be to God. Thank you. God bless you. I also want to point out, ladies and gentlemen, how ironic that those who are arguing for abortion are all the survivors of an abortion culture. The most dangerous place to be in England is in your mother's womb. More humans die in their mother's womb than in any other place in society. 9.5 million people have died because of abortion in the UK. We've killed more people in the UK 
than the Nazis killed in six years of the Reich. 60 million people have died because of the abortion genocide. We condemn those Germans who are silent about the Holocaust. If you are silent about the abortion genocide, then you are culpable for the abortion genocide. Have a conscience, have some courage, and stand up against an evil in our society in the same way that you would condemn the murder of Jews because they were Jewish. We are killing children just because they are unborn. It is murder from beginning to end. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Any questions going once? Any questions going twice? Any questions going three times? Thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate that you listen carefully, and I hope that this message spurns you to something good in your life. If you're pregnant and you don't know what to do, just contact a pro-life group and they will find you support and counselling about how to continue your pregnancy to term and what to do if you're not in a position to raise your child. So ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to come in, I want to talk about the situation of sexual grooming gangs in the UK.